Eric Sprott, Rick Rule, and Keith Newmeyer are three successful resource investors coming together for one simple reason, to buy cheap assets from distressed companies and seize this once in a decade opportunity to buy gold, silver, and other mineral projects for pennies on the dollar. First Mining Finance Corp, trading on the TSX Venture under FF, a recently launched venture with the sole purpose to acquire advanced stage natural resource projects and starting on day one with 18 projects, management has already identified over 60 additional projects to acquire. Learn more about First Mining Finance at Future Money Trends slash Invest Right. I, I think it's interesting, this whole safe haven aspect that the U.S. is benefiting from. But, you know, the longer this goes on, I mean, I've heard this analogy about the U.S. being the last room in the house to burn down but if every room in the house is burning down you know and the world has nowhere else to go does the last room actually burn down you know what I mean? if, if the everything i mean could it is it possible for the whole world to just have this collapse or is it relative to how the other countries are doing the united states the united states dollar is not the last room the last room gold and silver are the last rooms they're the only real money we have the quote strongest currency because it's the most widely used it's the you know it, it's 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 our it's your it's our debt but it's your problem thing it's the most widely used currency now of course it's the world is is slowly de-dollarizing led by you know chinese russian efforts but the fact is the dollar is still the most widely used the most widely circulated and traded and central banks have the most uh, of reserves of dollars so the fact is that of course it's going to be the last to burn down they can print the most money with that have, and have it have the least effect the effects have been horrific i mean the economy right now look at that you know americans are, are all-time record on entitlements record low family uh, family uh, creation and, and home ownership and labor participation and a record high cost of living so it hurts us but you know us secular americans us 300 million of us don't realize that because we the, the other 6.8 or 6.9 billion people don't have the reserve currency, they are suffering from the inflation that we've exported to them. So yeah, our all the rooms are burning right now. I mean, the the dollar, the United States is burning too. The only thing, the only reason you don't realize it as much is because the PPT is going hog wild. Uh, you know, goosing the stock market and the Fed is going hog wild, keeping interest rates low and the cartel is is, uh, is suppressing gold prices just to, you know, to kick the can a little. But, you know, we're burning just like everyone else, just not as intensely at the moment. And eventually, you know, the, the analogy I've always said is, you know, we're the head of the totem pole and, the, you know, the tsunami is just washing up the totem pole and eventually it'll get to us, too. It's already getting us. But, you know, it has us and it will like every other fiat currency. I mean, look, we're not just the, you know, the fiat, the biggest, uh, you know, reserve, the biggest fiat uh, currency scheme ever. I mean, but, you know, we, we have the whole world as our tentacles. Everyone, everything that goes on in the world is linked to us. And when the world falls apart, we do too. I mean, you look at the, Ch the Chinese who have pegged their currency to ours. The Chinese, that peg has caused the, the most catastrophic deformations of the global economy imaginable for years now and now because they've pegged their kind of their their yuan to the dollar the yuan is going up at the time that their economic bubble is bursting so they desperately need their yuan to go down which means that you know at some point down the road when the dollar gets too strong they're going to do that and then you're going to have what i call the big bang of all big bangs when the chinese when the chinese uh, devalue not revalue devalue the yuan and of course what they'll ultimately have to do if they want to save the yuan is to disclose how much gold they have. So there's a whole chain of things that are going to go on over the next few years and maybe even sooner. Uh, and we don't know how they'll all turn out, but we know, uh, you know, how, how it will all play out. But we know what the end game is, which is why we just take precautions now in, the, in things we know will, uh, will win, like gold and silver, and we wait. Well, I, I can't argue with you there, and I agree with you, actually, 100%. I actually just had a recent interview 
with John Rubino and I was talking to him and he brought up negative interest rates and do you see this as a reality in the US it's it's kind of amazing because if you would have thought about people actually or the Federal Reserve actually purchasing their own treasury bonds it just doesn't work it's not a fundamentally sound thing and I would say years ago I would look at negative interest rates and be like that's impossible that just doesn't work on paper it doesn't make sense it's not a fundamentally sound thing to do but do you see this as a reality in the US in the upcoming future yeah well you know what it still doesn't make any sense uh, just like the, the concept print more money then the economy will get better it's, it makes the, an equal amount of sense zero uh, in the case of negative interest rates, maybe it even makes less sense because they're trying to what, what they think that they're going to do is they're going to get bank. They're going to get people to take their money out of the banks and spend it. The point is, people don't have any money. And, uh, you know, and they don't. And when you borrow, you don't get negative interest rates. The only negative interest rates or zero interest rates go to the banks. We get high. I just did an article. We're at like five year highs in interest rates. The average credit card rate is up to like 15 percent right now. And if you want a mortgage right now, the banks aren't lending because they're insolvent. You know, you, it's almost impossible to get it right now. So, you know, the, cons, the only negative interest rates there are are in your bank account. And, you know, you say, is it a reality in the States? It's a reality right now. We get zero, okay? Maybe they'll say you get 0 0.002, but it's zero. And now they're piling on fees after fees. We, you know, uh, we just, I, I only keep $1,000 in the banking system just to have basic services. We've had to move to, to, from one bank to another to another because they keep adding fees. So, you know, we're in a negative environment now. And in Europe, it's even worse where it's the official policy to be a negative interest rate. So, yeah, for the people, you get nothing in your bank account. And for the banks, you get 0% interest rate. So you can borrow it from the, from the Fed or the ECB and, and then real, and put it back in the financial markets, which are, which are supported by the government with more printed money, which works for a while until it doesn't. And that's why we're at all-time high valuations. Can you imagine all-time high valuations of both stocks and bonds at a time where you have the worst economic conditions of our lifetimes? And that's the, what I call the deformation uh, or David Stockman called it that, and I, I just use that term because it's so, it's so apt, of markets and economies. And that's why you have so much overcapacity in the economies, why you have so much high overvaluations, uh, so much borrowing, all that stuff. And of course, it's going to all crash. I mean, that's not even a question. The only question is whether it will crash 2008 style or 1929 style, or, while, or what will it crash hyperinflation style, as we're seeing in, say, hey, just look at Venezuela today. Rocketing sky, sky market, you know, I don't know what the number is on inflation. I'll bet it's getting close to triple digits now. So, you know, it's one or the other. It's just a matter of which. The case for precious metals going higher is very strong, and you're proving that right now. But the last thing that I did want to talk about is peak gold, peak silver. And this is very common term for oil. We've heard that a lot, and not so much with precious metals. And I was hoping you could just expand on this a little bit and kind of uh, educate people a little bit on what is peak gold and peak silver and what we're seeing and why this is a benefit to precious metals over the long term, in addition to all these other things that we've been talking about. Right. Well, I've been, you know, I was an in, in, uh, energy analyst on Wall Street for 10 years. So it's in my blood and a CFA. So it's in my blood to actually do fun a fundamental analysis. Uh, regardless of whether the markets are manipulated or not. And, you know, like my article today, which just came out, it's called Mining Industry Implosion Approaches DEFCON 1. I've been writing about this forever, especially because, as you know, I worked in the mining industry for many years. And, of course, I've been owning and following precious metals for 13 years. Um, because of the price suppression for, you know, we're talking about 15 years now or more, uh, the mining industry has been destroyed. It's not one of these, oh, well, it, it, it's, it's getting close to, so it's gone. Uh, the, the, the junior mining industry is, is long gone. It's almost non-existent now. Probably, I predicted years ago, most of it would be dead, and it is. Most of the companies that are around today are trading under, you know, 50 cents, or most of them probably under 20 cents. They have no money. They don't do anything. There haven't been any major discoveries in this sector in years. I mean, I wrote an article about the only major sec discovery since I've been in this sector 13 years uh, was the Fruta del Norte uh, gold discovery in Ecuador 
uh, in like 2007 or eight, and it's never been developed because the Ecuadorian government wants like a 75% royalty. So the point is, there's nothing out there, and the costs of everything else are going up. The costs of permitting and exploration and uh, and and environmental and tax regimes, and of course the commodity surge with like oil and and all the other inputs that are much higher that have made the costs impossible. So. You know, right now, the, the silver industry, just to pick one, because that's what I wrote about yesterday, you know, they're, they're, uh, their cost of production is probably $20. I mean, the best companies, it's 17 only including their byproduct revenues. Uh, and uh, But that's just the cost of producing current mines of the best companies. Most companies don't have big mines. They have small mines where the cost is much higher. And then you have the cost of actually sustaining the industry, meaning they have to at some point discover something. And because right now reserves are plummeting, especially at these low, low level, low prices. So the industry is to the point where the majors are falling apart right now. And most of them, their goals this year are simply to avoid bankruptcy. That's, you know, Newmont, Barrick, they're selling off whatever they can. Um, you know, and the South Africans, look at their stock prices. They're going to zero. Uh, and, and, you know, and the, and the silver guys, the Coeur Lens, the Hecklers, you know, these are poorly managed companies. Uh, which are falling apart. So, you know, there's no doubt in my mind that in the case of gold, that we peaked. I mean, this is it right here. There's no way with with all the all the production cuts that are gonna that are in process, the lack of development that's been going on, that that production is anywhere to go but down, and it could go down significantly. Now, silver is even trickier because two thirds of it of the production is byproduct, and it's mostly from lead, zinc, and copper mines. A little bit from gold, but mostly lead, zinc, and copper. And base metal prices, as they were in 2008, uh, you know, are falling pretty sharply. And I think they're going to fall far more because the level of economic activity is far less than in 2008. So, the, you know, right now, I expect we're going to have even further capital expenditure cuts across the board at these prices. We're going to have more mothballing of mines. And if the big one hits, as I expected, it, it's going to at some point. Demand will fall even further and prices will fall further. And at that point, you can really see a massive plunge in, uh, in silver supply. And even if it doesn't plunge, even if it just stays around here, we're talking about we're at record demand levels right now around the world, uh, certainly in the East. And, you know, soon it will be back there in the West. So it's going to be very, very tight. There's not a lot of inventory out there. And, uh, you know, that's why I think, you know, the combination of, of record demand, which will get a new catalyst when you have the next big crisis and, you know, essentially no real inventory and supply that has nowhere to go but down. We're talking about the perfect storm just from an economics 101 standpoint. Well, there you have it, everyone. That's Andy Hoffman with Miles Franklin. Andy, thanks for taking the time to talk with me and to educate us. If you want to be able to follow Andy, be sure to visit milesfranklin.com and you can read his blog there. And, of course, pick up some precious metals. Andy, thanks for taking the time with me today. It's my pleasure. You can uh, always give us a call, 800-822-8080, or you can email me at ahoffman at milesfranklin.com. Thanks so much, Andy. You take care. You too.